first thing I noticed when I got here this morning is that all of these ladies up here speaking had nice notebooks. I borrowed my son's school notebook <clears throat> to take all my notes in, and it says Parsippany Christian School. So I thought, well, I'm off to a good start. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I realized that I'm the new kid on the block. And I told somebody at our church in New Jersey, I said, I am going to be going up there with people like Mickey Mangan and Sister Nordstrom, who are definitely seasoned speakers. And here I go. So if I make mistakes, y'all are going to accept it because it is my first time. And it's just okay. <laughs> they uh, gave me a title. They said I had to come up with a title. I've never had to title a testimony. So this was my first time to give anything a title. And when I saw the brochures come out with all the sweet titles on them, I was glad that it came out after I titled mine. Because mine is Women Who Wear Army Green. Isn't that sweet? <laughs> Why couldn't it have been Mirror Mirror on the Wall or AT&T Call, you know, or Unveiled Face? <laughs> but I got something real sweet like Women Who Wear Army Green. <laughs> nice. I even asked God about it. He gave me an answer, too. I wanted to say something about my mother-in-law, and I have the floor. I have the opportunity to take advantage of that. And uh, I can say a lot of things about her. But one thing I can definitely say is that she has been a friend ever since I've met her. In fact, if there's ever been any little spats between my husband and I, she has always been on my side. <laughs> That's the truth. And she is rare. <laughs> One day I was in the car with my son, and I, it was one of those days, you know, and I needed to get all I could get, and I had a tape of Sister uh, Freeman in, and she really brought me up, and I put a tape of Sister Vesta Mangan in, and she brought me back down, and my son said, Mom, who's your favorite speaker? I said, well, um, I try to be real diplomatic, you know, I said, I like this one for this reason, and this one for this reason, and I said, why, who's yours? He said, Mama Lumpkin. <laughs> So that's his favorite speaker, and, he, and that's, that's all right with me. My two sweet sister-in-laws who are here are more like sisters. Uh, my son wants to sing like Mickey and preach like Uncle Anthony. And here I'm, me and Dad standing over the sidelines saying, Hey, remember us? <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. And my little sister-in-law, Tanya, she keeps me supplied in books and tapes. And more times than she will ever know, she has ministered to me and sending me a certain book or a certain tape that I needed right at the right moment, and God has ministered through her to me so many times, especially in this past year, and I appreciate that, Tanya. God has used her for me, and I love that. Uh, I got another relative here. Y'all probably don't know I'm related to Sister Shields. <laughs> her husband and, and I are second cousins, so we're shoestring relatives, and I'm proud of that, and she did so good this morning. Sister Nita Hale is like a sister. She's been my prayer partner for several years, and I wanted to tell you this. When she was up here talking about AT&T calls and that whenever she feels to call somebody and she was telling us we need to do that, she does that to me. In fact, she did it about one month ago. She called me and she said, Jelaine, what's going on? I've had you on my mind for two days, real strong. I want to know exactly what's going on. <laughs> and I took the veil off and I told her I unloaded my wagon on her and she was sweet and kind and she listened and she had a word for me and I appreciate that, Nita. But she has done that for me many times, many times. So, my notebook from Parsippany Christian School and my wonderful little notes on women who wear the army green. And here I go. <laughs> Today I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. I am going to remove a veil that has been, I think it's going to be hard to do. And when my mother-in-law asked me to give it a title, I said, I don't know what it, I, I don't know what your theme is, and she couldn't remember either. <laughs> and uh, immediately, God dropped, immediately. I didn't even have a chance to fast and pray about it. It was immediate. He said, women who wear the army green. I said, right. And then, two days later, he woke me up at 6 o'clock in the morning. And he's done this to me a couple times in the past, and I know when it's him to get up and move. And so I began to write. And he gave me everything that I've gotten. I wrote seven pages, and my husband said, that's nothing. You'll spit that out in five minutes as fast as you talk. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and I'm trying to slow down because I know I will get faster, but Lumpkin calls me a Gatlin gun, whatever that is. So anyway, I have never ever had an interest in military affairs. And when I asked the Lord about it, he said, I want you to relate to those ladies exactly what you have experienced in the past few months. Because there are hurting women who are on the front lines where you have been. And there are women who will be there soon, and women who are there right now, and they need to hear what you and I have just gone through. So I'm going to share with you something very personal and very private that I haven't shared with very many. And it just happened a few months ago. When I received the Holy Ghost, what I did not realize at the time, for I was only nine, that I had really enlisted in an army. And it was God's army. And but I, you see, I've been in boot camp for 28 years. It only usually lasts six weeks, eight weeks. <clears throat> I'm not a real slow lear learner usually, but evidently God thought I needed a little extra time in boot camp. But recently we have experienced some front line battles. And I know that some of you here today have been there already. In fact, I told some of the ladies down front during the break, I said, I'm going to talk about what you have already experienced, but for me, it's new. And for me, it's just something else. So I know that some of you, like me, walked in these doors yesterday weary and tired, and they call it in the Army, battle fatigue. And uh, that's okay. It's okay to get tired. But have you ever been around men or women who have come back from the reserves or the army, like maybe a father or an uncle or a brother. And have you ever heard them tell of all their stories? They are so proud of every battle scar, every wound, every hill, every mountain that was climbed and conquered. And they'll tell you the same story over and over and over. In fact, they even have their own little clubs and they call them VFW halls. They got clubs and they're proud of it. Wars always cost us something. It takes a lot of wear and tear on our physical as well as our mental bodies. And I know that from Vietnam, some of the people that we have come in contact with, and of course there's so much out on the men who have come back from Vietnam, the mental pressures and the strengths that they have un endured, and it shows. But they're still proud that they were able to even go to fight for their country. Some of us have been knocked down in battles, ladies. We've even been bruised like they talked about yesterday. We've even been beat up from time to time, and there is nothing wrong with ever being knocked down or being bruised or being hurt or being offended or being in the battlefield. There is nothing wrong with battle fatigue. It's the enemy who says you failed. It's the enemy who says you're a loser because that's just not so. The ones who are the losers are the ones who, when they get down, stay down. It's the ones who pick themselves back up that God is going to make you a winner. I love Micah 7 because it says, When I fall, I shall arise again. Isn't that great? They even knew it then that you were going to fall. And I have stumbled and fell so many times, but I've also, thank God, been able to get up so far. Why would God instruct us to put on the whole armor in Ephesians 6 if he didn't know we weren't going to be knocked down? He gave us that precious verses and scriptures in vision six because he knew we would become targets of the enemy coming under the attacks of satan and so putting on the armor of god is not a suggestion it is there as a commandment and one translation of philip's the six i mean of uh, ephesians the sixth chapter is in conclusion be strong not in yourselves but in the lord in the power of his boundless resource, put on God's complete armor so that you can successfully resist all the devil's methods of attack. For our fight is not against any physical enemy. It's, in fact, what we just went through, I told my husband, I said, if I could put my hands on it, I'd feel a whole lot better. But it wasn't anything I could touch because it was not physical. It is against organizations and powers that are spiritual. We are up against the unseen power that controls this dark world and spiritual agents from the very headquarters of evil. Therefore, you must wear, not if you feel like it. How many of you get up every morning and feel like getting dressed? Thank God we do. Therefore, 
you must wear the whole armor of God that you may be able to resist evil in its day of power. And I believe we're living in that day of power. I know we are. And that even when you fought to a standstill, you may still stand your ground. And I love that. Because we are crossing enemy lines and we're going to stand ground. Take your stand then with truth as your belt, righteousness as your breastplate, the gospel of peace firmly on your feet, salvation as your helmet, and in your hand the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. Above all, be sure you take faith as your shield, for it can quench every, 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 every burning missile. Every burning missile, no matter what he attacks you with or hurls at you, it will quench every burning missile the enemy hurls. Pray at all times with every kind of spiritual prayer, keeping alert and persistent. That means all the time. As you pray for Christ, all Christ's men and women. So not only do I put on the armor, every morning I put it on, and I'm not ready for battle till I put it on. Every morning it is a part of my routine. When I get up in the morning, the first thing I do is I head for the kitchen and the coffee pot. In fact, I told people in our church, you can't even be a part of this church unless you drink coffee. <laughs> Good, I got coffee drinkers. But when I get up, I start talking to God out loud. My dog loves it, he don't mind. And I say, God, this is the day that the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. The good hand of the Lord is upon me today. And I just start talking to him, and then when I get done with that part and praising him, then I say, now then, Lord, I'm going to put on your clothes. I'm going to put on the whole armor because I don't know what's in my day, but you do. Like Sister Ewing, you know, and she cute and she puts up on her little costumes, you know. Now then, I don't go grocery shopping with this thing on, and I sure didn't come walking through the airport with it on the other day. But in my area, if I went grocery shopping with it on, nobody would notice. <laughs> I think it was part, you know, just off some other nut on the street in New Jersey. <laughs> and that's okay. But we've been crossing a whole lot of enemy lines lately. And we have definitely got to be ready with God's clothes on, with the whole armor that he has prepared and given to us. A man in our church who was in the reserve gave me this jacket to wear. And he said, Sister Lumpkin, I've got a brand new one I just got. He's been in it for a few years. And I said, no, Brother Maybank, I want your old one. One that's been worn, one that's been sweated in, one that's been on the ground and rolled around. And he said, well, that one's got a bunch of badges on it. I said, great, I like badges. <laughs> so he let me borrow his and the morning that the Lord gave me this I, I so enjoyed what God shared with me and then I shared it with my husband in the kitchen and he got excited with me but when I talked to Brother Maybank I said Brother Maybank I need to know some principles of warfare and when he gave me a piece of paper that had nine principles of warfare which I want to share with you real quickly he said and when I went back and I checked my notes with what God had given me and the nine principles of warfare, every part of it fit. I was so awed by how God knew and cared so much about the military and the warfare that we are facing spiritually that he brought it down to me so I can understand it. And he made it so plain and so clear. Number one is objective. That means every military operation should be directed towards a clearly defined, decisive, and attainable objective. What this means is you've got to know exactly what you're going after. <laughs> For the last 10 months or a year, I have been asking God to help me have a, a more powerful prayer life. I don't like going to prayer and praying, oh God, hallelujah, thank you Jesus, glory to God, and I'm wasting my time and God's time. I don't have time to waste. When I get down to pray, I want to know I can touch him and God will hear me and all heaven stands still. I don't have time up where I'm at to waste and neither do you. Neither do you. 
We were here just this past Christmas with the Lumpkin family for Christmas, and while we were here, we were able to come here to the church, and I purchased Sister Harden's book on prayer. It has become, and if you haven't purchased that book yet, you have not learned how to pray, <laughs> or maybe you had, and that's why you don't need it, but I needed it. And so it has become such a part of me. I carry it with me with my Bible. When I go to church, wherever I am at, I have got that prayer book with me. It has helped me. It has become a part of me and has given me direction. It has so much more clearly defined my prayer life. And I have now have definite objectives. I know exactly what I'm going after. Today, I'm going after, you can say, I'm going after that hill, that area. I'm going after it. And back in February, we came under a definite attack, a spiritual attack in our home. And I don't believe that the Holy Ghost filled people of today can be devil possessed. But spirits can attach themselves to us, lady, like a leech. <laughs> it can weigh around our necks and we sometimes, I, I don't know why we've accepted a whole lot of things that we have not ever had. We shouldn't have ever accepted them, but we have. And they're just weights. And this doesn't have to ha does not have to happen at all. For too long, we have just accepted them as a part of our makeup or whatever. But during this time in February, when we were fighting such spiritual warfare, my husband and I both recognized that we had become targets from several different areas and several different spirits. And that, now, we've been in New Jersey for six years, and I told him just the other night, I said, you know, we've been attacked a couple of times. And I said, maybe we're, we can start seeing the signs of it. Maybe we're becoming, getting to the place where we can start recognizing it, you know. I, there's been so many different things happened to us, and I've written a whole lot of them down because I don't ever want to forget. So for the first day or so, it has lasted over a week, but the first day or so, I was so stunned by it, by the whole thing that was going on in our home. And my first reaction, after being stunned for two days, was to call for help. I wanted to call Mickey. I wanted to call Sister Nordstrom. I wanted to call somebody to help pray. I couldn't pray because there was such a thick, dark cloud hovering in our home and in the church. I could not break out of it. And uh, there was no one at home, Mickey. Y'all were in because of the time, and no one was at the Nordstrom. I figured they must have been there. And I felt totally alone and helpless. Has anybody ever felt alone? Like there was nobody around, nobody cared? <laughs> I, I knew they cared, but they just, you know, weren't there. Which is exactly what the enemy wanted me to feel like. Then it came to me like just like a flash or cold water in my face that I didn't have to accept what was going on in my home. And I was not helpless because with God, it's a majority. Me and God were a majority. So I picked up my baby. My son was in school, my husband was gone, and I picked up my baby when he left and I carried her through my house and I went from room to room pleading the blood over every door, every window, I went into every room, and I didn't stop there. I started binding every kind of a spirit that I could think of. I said, God, I don't even know what I'm facing. There are so many things coming at me right now. You give me direction. And I started, because Matthew 18 says, whatsoever you bind is going to be bound, and whatsoever you lose. And I said, God, I'm not asking you to bind them, because that's, that's, that's against his word. Because he said, whatsoever you find, it's going to be bound. So I said, okay, God, here I go. I'm going to just go according to what you said. So I started buying all kinds of spirits. I got it real clear. I started binding frustration, anxiety, worry, doubt, and discouragement. I've been there. I'm a pretty positive person. I don't ever like to say negative things. I like to say positive things. I like to think positive. And I have been discouraged. And anything that I thought might be attacking our home or our church, I went through my home and I started binding and I started pleading. And it was as if I could almost see that cloud move. You don't understand, maybe some of you can relate to it, but I could almost see it. It was so thick. And I felt like I, it was just enclosing me and cutting my hair off. But I could almost see it leaving. I knew it was leaving. I knew it was lifting. So I remember the first because of the Times meeting that I went to six years ago. It was two months before we moved to New Jersey. And I remember Brother Kilgore was a speaker, and he said that God had given him a vision in his motel room that day. In his vision, he saw uh, cities, and he saw thick black clouds hovering over these cities. And he said he just, the next vision that he saw was the congregation there because of the Times. 
and he saw ministers and their wives as if they were flying out of their seats and going towards these cities. Is that right, Mickey? He said that. And he said as they would get closer to these areas, he said he began to plead with God. God, don't send them there. That They are too young. It's such a dark area. There's so much sin and wickedness there. God, they're too young. And he said he watched as those young people pulled out their Bibles and they became a flaming sword. And it started cutting through all that thick, dark cloud. It began to push back. It was going. It was going. It had to leave. It had to leave. And I have been able to watch that happen. Is it all gone? No. No, not hardly. But we have been crossing enemy, enemy lines. And we're doing it. Y'all are doing it. We're doing it. Number two is the offensive. Seize, retain, and exploit the initiative. That means we've got to be the aggressor. You've got to be the first one to launch the attack. And what didn't dawn on me until just about a week ago, when I got to thinking about all of this, and I was going over these notes that he gave me, being the first one to launch the attack. And I got to thinking, well, what happened before February that would cause all of this? And I team teach in our senior high class, and I mentioned this last night. We team teach, and we had about four or five teenagers in there. And we decided to start talking to those kids on things that they could face today, things that they were going through. I started reading their kind of materials. I started, I wanted to know what they were going through at school. I started talking to them. I said, tell me. In fact, the kids told me they are faced with drugs every day as they walk onto their school grounds. And you may not agree with how we, how we approach this, um, all I know is that you've got to be responsible for the area that you're in and we felt to start teaching out of a book by Josh McDowell on why wait it talks about dating habits it talks about sex it talks about AIDS it talks about drugs it talks about suicide you see the reason why we did that I had a 15 year old girl in my class who's pregnant I've got another boy in my class who's already tried to commit suicide we were not reaching them and we live in such a hard, cold area. These kids' parents, no, most of them do not come to church. They come on their own. And if we didn't reach them, they'd be out those doors and gone forever into a sin-filled area. I could not re risk losing anymore. I have come there to push back the cloud. I've come there on a spiritual warfare, and I had to do something. I was desperate. I'll try anything first. I'll try it. I'll try it. And so we did. And so we began to watch our class grow. And it got to where we had 15 in there. And they all began receiving the Holy Ghost and praying through and they've been shouting and on the first two rows of the church and all of them had received the Holy Ghost except three and these kids parents did not come to church in fact one of the girls her mother is a drug addict and her ways of punishing this young girl is by not feeding her she doesn't she takes won't even go to the grocery store won't buy her food won't feed the child she's uh, 15 or 16 years old and she lives a hard life. In fact, the other day, she came into church and both arms were wrapped in bandages all the way up to her elbows. I said, what happened to you? She says, my mother and I got into an argument and to keep from getting, hurting her, I ran my fist through the windows and I've been in the hospital. I've got stitches all up and down my arm. I'm facing that. But just two weeks ago, the last three of them got the Holy Ghost on the same night. <laughs> we launched an all-out attack for that class. And we came under attack. And I figured, God, that must have been what it is. What a privilege. What a privilege. I love it. I don't love the attacks, don't get me wrong. But I love working for God. I love watching God be in the winner and conquering. Number three is unity of command. For every objective, there should be unity of effort under one responsible commander. So if you're a pastor or a pastor's wife, or a Sunday school teacher, or a prayer group leader, a musician, or even a parent, whatever your position, if two of you agree, it shall be done. Matthew 18, 19, 20, if you even find one person who will agree. So if here today I thought, wouldn't it be great, God, if there's seven, 700 women there who will agree today that we're going to have revival? In each one of you'll say, hey, Sister Lumpkin, I believe we're going to have revival in New Jersey. I'll believe with you you're going to have it in Arkansas, in Wichita, Kansas. I'll believe with you for Louisiana and Texas. Believe with me for New Jersey. Will you do that? <laughs> there is something about unity in the spirit that gets God's attention. He loves it when you and I agree. 
Number four is mass. That means to concentrate combat power at the decisive place and time to unify our attack. That means using all the manpower that we have at the same time. And so on Sunday mornings at our church, we have one service on Sundays, and it starts at 1.30 in the afternoon. We rent an Episcopal church building, and we cannot have the building until in the afternoons, and we can't have it at night. So we have a big service on Sundays. That's Sunday school and church. But at 11 o'clock, I started at the beginning of the year, and just dawned on me. I just started at the beginning of the year. <laughs> anyway, I launched another attack and didn't realize it. But at the beginning of the year, I asked people if they'd be willing to come at 11 o'clock, which was two and a half hours before church, and pray with me. And I have about four or five, and it's never usually the same four or five, it's a different four or five. And we come together at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings and we pray. Now I don't let them just pray a myth. We unify. I have used Sister Harden's book and I say, and I'll get it out and I'll talk to her for about five minutes because I want them to spend at least an hour talking to God. And so I say, this is how you're going to pray today. This is the chapters you're going to read to God. This is what you're going to bind today, and this is what you're going to lose today. And don't forget to put angels around the doors and plead the blood. And then I ask them to go by the pulpit and to bind and to loose and to ask out of God to put angels of power and mercy so that the ministry of the Word can go forth to reach people who have never ever heard it or have been or bruised and need God. And we do that. The first time we did it, we, I said, won't you ask God today to loose the Holy Ghost so somebody can get the Holy Ghost? And it happened. We were all in shock. The next thing I said, hey, I said, that was fun. Let's try asking God to heal somebody. And a woman came in who hadn't been there in about two months who was so sick. And she called and she said, I'm coming in just to be healed. And she walked in and was healed. <laughs> God loves unity. We unified. We knew we were going after that hill. That's what we went after. And that's what God did. Isn't that great? I love it. Number five is economy of force. That means to allocate minimum essential combat power to secondary efforts. And no, I didn't understand what that meant, and he had to explain it for me, too. It means to have a two-to-one ratio against your enemy. And I thought about that. I thought, you know, when I have a special request, something really personal, I want to keep my veil on, you know, and I looked it for one person to see, I'll call maybe one or two people and ask them to help me pray about this. As long as I'm not alone, you know, the enemy would like to keep you, as soon as you start having problems, make you think you're all alone and you need to stay alone because nobody else would understand and nobody else cares. Well, that's just a lie. You need to call somebody for help. You need to get you a two-to-one ratio against the enemy to fight. Number six, maneuver. Place the enemy in a position of disadvantage through the flexible application of combat power. I love putting him at a disadvantage. But the enemy has done that to us a lot of times. For example, depression. And when we are depressed, we are definitely at a disadvantage because most of the time I want to stay in bed and cover my head and not ever get out. I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to go shopping. If I don't want to go shopping, and I'm really discouraged. But we can turn that around and place him at the disadvantage by start singing, This is the day, this is the day that the Lord has made, that the Lord has made. And just start singing. He doesn't know what you're thinking. He only knows what you say. And all of a sudden, you caught him off guard. And he's saying, Wait a minute. I sent the spirit of discouragement. Why is she singing, Thanks the Lord, this is the day that the Lord has made? What's going on down there? Hey, you guys, you're not doing your job. I caught him off guard. I love it. I love it. So, in the Old Testament, I have found out that praisers and worshipers always went out first. <laughs> and then they won. Here's a praise I like. The good hand of the Lord is upon me. And then I like quoting the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd. You better back off. <laughs> So about a year ago, hmm, I'm going to unload something on y'all. The people that we rent are, we live in a two-story house, and we live on the second floor, and, if, and they live on the bottom floor, and they own the house. And our landlord, she's Italian. Is that not telling anybody anything? Okay. She loves to yell. And uh, we live upstairs, 
we've given them home Bible study. They have been in our church. In fact, every anniversary, because we, they have let us live, we don't let us live there, but I mean, the first year we were there, they let us have services up in our apartment. And so every anniversary, we bring them into our congregation and we present them with something. We bring them up front, we do all this for them, you know. But still, she loves to yell and she loves to cuss. I've learned more in six years the English language <laughs> than ever before in my life. In fact, um, my children have learned a lot too. <laughs> Let me tell you, they can come into our apartment when we are there or when we are not there. We cannot change the locks. We've, just, we've checked with lawyers. And in fact, they have come in when we have been in bed asleep. And we can't do anything about it. Hi, how are you guys this morning? <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> So just the other day, she was cussing and yelling at me because I had my kitchen window open. <laughs> that didn't startle y'all, it blew my mind. She says, you're letting out the heat. I said, I paid for it. She said, I don't care. And she's outside in the backyard, which is about a two by four backyard anyway, and the houses are only four feet apart from the other two houses. And she's yelling, Jolene, she never has said my name right, Jolene, touch that window. Well, I did, but I broke it. <clears throat> so maybe y'all wouldn't have done that, but I've listened to her mouth for six years. <laughs> okay, I'm carnal. <laughs> I'm sorry, I slipped. I put it on, it just didn't work. <laughs> My kids are not allowed to play in her front yard, her porch, or her backyard, or the driveway. They, they're welcome to her street, <laughs> right? My little girl does not go out. My son does, and he's easy to find in the neighborhood. He's the only white boy there. Anyway, now remember, when I get ready to tell you this, for six years, she has cussed, and please, y'all understand, I'm, I'm unveiling something, y'all. She has cussed, and she has yelled, and she has called us anything but a Christian. In fact, she told my husband, she said, you call yourself a preacher? He said, you call yourself a Catholic? <laughs> didn't work <laughs> so one day I went down to the basement and she proceeded Chrissy might remember this to cuss me out good I don't know I don't even remember what it was about and it was just one of those days when she shouldn't have said anything and I turned around to walk away and it just hit me wrong I turned back around and I looked at her and I said spirit I bind you in Jesus name and I plead the blood over you <laughs> never done it before and I turned around to walk out and I was I was so upset and, and shaken all over and I walked upstairs I'm going in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name thank you Jesus thank you Jesus and my husband comes to the door and he said what is going on <laughs> we knew they're gonna evict us you know but do you know that for three months now we'll grab this they live downstairs and you can hear paper thin walls you can hear everything for three months, we did not hear them, see them, speak to them, run into them. For three months, my husband said, do it again. <laughs> I guess you could say I caught the enemy off guard that day. He was not expecting me to do that. <laughs> he was sure surprised and so was she. So well, the other day, while in prayer, the Lord gave me a scripture after she had yelled me about the kitchen window. Uh, I guess I'm not really been enough built up in immunity, believe me. It still devastates me when she does. I still get upset. I still go to my room and cry. And my husband says, you're crazy. Don't let her bother you. But then he gets upset too. So anyway, I was in prayer and I just opened up my Bible and I was just reading. And the Lord led me to a scripture verse, Psalms 47 and 3. And it goes like this. You're going to like this. He shall subdue the people under us. I put it on. And let me tell you something. You know what subdue? I went and got my dictionary. I went bananas. I wasn't sure if I knew what subdue meant. I went and it says it means to conquer. It means to overcome, to obliterate. <laughs> They're history. And then about two days later, I thought, God, is that verse really there? <laughs> and I went back and I read it again, but I picked up verse 1 and 2. 
in verse 1 and 2 is praise and worship. It says, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of trium triumph. He shall subdue the people under us. It was praise and worship again. I was so crazy. It was there all the time. All I had to do was praise and worship. And I've been trying. I promise I have. And he's done it. I mean, it's been pure peace and quiet in our apartment for the last two weeks. It's been incredible. I've even met her in the basement. She smiled. <laughs> That's real unusual. Number eight is security. That means never permit the enemy to acquire an unexpected advantage. And what I did not know is that you are always vulnerable after you've seized territory for a counter attack. I didn't know that. Y'all did? I didn't. Do you know why? It's because you feel you have conquered and you've already won. So you can relax. Wow, our class grew to 15? This is a breeze. This is great. I can just relax. And then all of a sudden, whew, everything hit. I mean, hand grenades, machine guns, everything started going off. The enemy will always try and attack from behind. He can't even do it from the front. He's got to come from the behind, you know? Thinking that this is your weakest point. And they say that in the military, when there's a front line, what they have behind them is called your support group. Your support group is made up of the cooks, the supply men, and transportation. In actuality, they must be stronger than the front line. That's your prayer warriors, your praisers, your worshipers, your singers. You've got to be stronger than those on the front line. You've got to be stronger than the hardened. You've got to be stronger than the hales. You've got to be stronger than your pastor and his wife. You've got to be a praiser and a worshiper, and you've got to hold their hands up. You've got to be stronger than even those on the very front lines doing battle. Anyone on the front lines, and I love this, has priority of fire. I thought, man, anything I want, God, if I'm on the front lines, I get it. Whatever you want, you need it, he'll give it to you immediately. Immediately. Do you know that it's top priority? When you're on the front lines doing battle, you become top priority priority to God. So in February when all of this was happening to us and I felt the definite spiritual attack, I mean, the, you know, the spiritual attacks, I felt to call some ladies in our church, not knowing that this was going along with those nine principles of warfare. I felt God lead me to call. And I called some ladies who I knew could touch God, some prayer warriors. And at the time, I didn't realize I had priority of fire, but I just trusted God. So I just felt God lead me and I, so I did it. I just said, God, I need some heavy ammunition right now. And I think what I need is the newest machine gun you got. That would be great. Machine gun, the newest one. I want a whole bunch of them. So I called up Patty Miglarese. And I said, Patty, put on your whole armor today, girl. You're going to battle. I want you to start binding some spirits. I want you to bind the spirit of heaviness, which is depression. And then I want you to bind the spirit of haughtiness, which is pride. Now I said, God, I think I need something else. How about some great big hand grenades? You got a whole case of hand grenades sitting around up there? So I called Sister Rita. And I said, Rita, what are you doing? I want you to put on your whole armor today. I want you to start binding some spirits. Start binding lying. Start binding gossip. Start binding some spirits of jealousy, which is hatred and anger and strife. I said, you're going to battle today, and don't y'all quit. We're going to do some stuff in the spiritual world. And I'm, I'm telling you, it's working. It's working. It's working. And I said, God, I need a great big shiny tank. One that's going to those big guns on the front, you know. I want one of them that turns all the way around, that's going to get everything, and you can't miss nothing. So I called up Sister Kay Bullock, and I said, Kay, I need you to bind some spirits today. How about the spirit of infirmity, which is oppression and weakness, and bondage, which we did today, which is fear. We've been binding some stuff in New Jersey, and we're crossing a whole lot of enemy lines, but my support group is right back there. They're right behind me all the way. We're going to cross some enemy lines, and we're going to do it together. He's not going to catch us off guard, not ever again. And we're going to win. You know, you never go into battle thinking you're going to lose. They teach you that in the military. They teach you that when you cross enemy lines, you cross them knowing you're going to win them. Why don't we do that more in the spirit? We face things, things sometimes and think it's too big for God and he can't do it. Who said? He said, all things are possible. And I'm crazy enough to believe him for all things. And the enemy has tried to scare us out and to cuss us out. And just a few weeks after moving to New Jersey, we had moved there in May. 
and we went out one night in the month of May. We'd only been there a couple of weeks, and we decided to go out and buy us a White Castle hamburger. You ever heard of them? They cost about 39 cents, 49 cents now, I think. We were going to splurge. You know, home missionaries got gobs of money. <laughs> so we decided to splurge, and we was going to go after us a White Castle hamburger. And my son, at that time, was just five years old, and he was in the car, and we came to the end of a street that you had to make a left or a right, and right in front of us was a hospital. And as we got up on this hospital, it was about 10 o'clock at night, so as we got closer, there was a man sitting in the middle of the road in a wheelchair. And we'd only been in town for two or three weeks. And as, you know, your first thought is, oh, we've got to help this guy. And the closer we got, sat there. There were no other cars around, nothing, no body around, and there was a hospital. And my husband said, should we help him? And the stare that he was putting on us, I knew. I said, he's not there. He's not hurting. I said, he's trying to warn us. I said, we're going to leave him sitting. And we did. And maybe you would have stopped and helped him. I applaud you, but not me. And we've been trying, and the enemy has tried to scare us. In fact, just about two months ago, my husband told me that as he was driving home from picking up our son at school, he said, I turned the corner. And he says, when I did, there was a lady standing there. And he said, I wouldn't have normally paid any attention, but he says, she put a look on me like she hated my guts, as if she knew me. And I honestly believe she did. We've crossed too many enemy lines and we've upset too many spirits for things to be just a bed of roses. So we let the man sit in the middle of the street. And have I ever been frustrated, ladies? Yeah, I've been frustrated. Have I ever been tired? You bet I've been tired, I'm tired today. <laughs> have I ever been discouraged? I sure have. But I'm in New Jersey to stay. And I'm gonna help push back every dark cloud that I can because I know God is for me and that God is on my side. And I haven't got anything to fear as long as I know God is for me. Number nine, this is the last step. It's called simplicity. It means to prepare a clear, uncomplicated plans and clear, concise orders to ensure thorough understanding. When we went to New Jersey, it was clear to us that we were going there to start a church. We knew that. But do you know that there were people who came up to us and say, why are you going there? That's a wicked city. It's full of sin. That's why we're going. You know? um, that's a hard place. You know, the East Coast, they're cold people. That's sin on every street corner. You're going to raise your kids there? No one wants God in New Jersey or on the East Coast. Why, why don't you stay down here in the Bible Belt? You can't even start a church there. People have tried and they left. Well, every time I'd hear those words, I'd rebuke them. Under my breath, I'm going to say, in Jesus' name, I rebuke those words. I don't believe them. And for too long, people have called it the cold East Coast. But I started the rumor, like I told you last night, calling it the Revival Belt. And you know, I finally got two or three people to agree with me on the East Coast that it's the Revival Belt, and we're having revival. Our churches are flourishing. They are growing. One home missions church just 30 minutes from us has only been there one year longer. They had 200 last Sunday. I'm telling you, we're having revival. It's growing. It's fantastic. And we're, it's starting to catch, you know. And if I can ask y'all to do this, would you all say to somebody beside you, East Coast is Revival Belt. That means we all agree and it means it's really going to happen. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to go home feeling much better. In the Bible, someone else was told, don't start a church. Peter, don't bother going to Babylon. They don't want God in Babylon. It's a wicked city. Don't waste your time in Babylon. It's horrible. They, they don't want churches in Babylon. It's full of sin. Don't go. <laughs> but in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 13, Peter is writing back to those churches. And let them know, hey, there's a church there, and we salute you back home. 
And let me say it loud and clear for you today. There's a church and some saints in Wolf Orange, New Jersey, where they said it couldn't be done. That stands here today, and we salute the Bible Belt. We love it. God is up there. God is doing great things. And we're going to salute the devil. You hear us? We're in revival. I'm having revival. So if the devil's ever told you it can't be done in your city, no matter how big or how small, don't ever bother to listen. He's a liar. And did you ever know that when John wrote in the book of Revelation, the first chapter in the ninth verse, he says, and I, John, was on an isle called Patmos. Do you know why he called it an island called Patmos? If he'd have been from Corinth or Babylon, it would have been easily recognized because everybody knew where that was. But nobody at that time had ever heard of Patmos. Nobody. So John says, I'm from an island that is called Patmos. And so today, most of you have never heard of West Orange, New Jersey until today. And you've probably never been there. But I come from a place called West Orange, New Jersey. But it was on that Isle of Patmos that John received revelations from God. And he got such depth in the Lord. And he was able to write in the book of Revelations what he saw and what he obtained from God. And some of you, if you were from, you could go anywhere and say, I'm from Little Rock, and people would know where that was. And you could go uh, anywhere and say, I'm from St. Louis, or I'm from New York, and people know. But how about you who have said, nobody knows where Blue Eye is. How about Walnut Ridge? You can go very far up in the East Coast and people would know where Truman was. But what you need to do is stand up and salute. You need to say, hey, there is a church in Truman, Arkansas, and we're going to stand up and we're going to salute the world because God said it could be done. <laughs>